All my ladies. Women in music. This is Lydia Great Tricks on Gorgeous FM. Yeah. All my ladies. Yes, it is. Good good evening. It is eight o'clock, which means that it is time for the Woman of the Week now. And this week, it's music superstar M. Griner. Uh, she is actually also my first international Woman of the Week because she lives in Ontario, Canada. Um, and she's had a career spanning over two decades. Uh, she's even toured with David Bowie and she's worked with astronaut and musician Chris Hadfield. Um, and over the years, she's made music of all different types of genres um, and she's just brought out her first jazz album, Just For You. Um, being such a talented musician, I really wanted to know where this passion began. Well, I grew up in the country and there wasn't a whole lot going on, um, but we had the radio. Um, it sounds like I grew up in like 1950 or something, but our family was very musical. We took piano lessons and guitar lessons and my dad was a big jazz fan um but around eight age eight i discovered pop and rock and i just fell in love so a lot of the things that i listened to came from detroit because when i where i lived it was within that range of the detroit radio stations so i got a good mix of american kind of pop and british too obviously and then whatever was going on in Canada. So I really, really loved um, finding out about it. And at the same time, I was learning piano. So I think at some point, it just dawned on me that I could try to write songs. And that's where it all began. Do you think there was like a point in your life where you were kind of like being a musician as, as a young girl? or And then there was like a point where the, you thought, oh my God, I'm actually really good at this. Maybe I should pursue it. <laughs> It's so dangerous when you think you're really good because I remember thinking songs I wrote when I was 12 or 13 were so awesome. And when I look back at them, they're so embarrassing. Um, so I think that instead of thinking, oh, I'm so great at this, I was just so curious and I loved it so much. And I did have my eyes set on a record deal all through my teens. So it was sort of a time where I believed I could get one. So... I eventually did, but I think there was just, it was a little bit of a game to me too. Like, you know, I wondered how far, how far could I get really, you know? So it was fun. Overall kind of like growing up, was it like a, a good kind of musical experience, you reckon? Yeah. You know what? It was a great time because there was nothing else. Um, like, I think that me, I had two older brothers. We used music to soothe ourselves um, from boredom, from frustration, you know, just growing up and not understanding what was going on. So we really, really formed this deep relationship with music um, and became, you know, collectors of, you know, tapes <laughs> and like listening to records and then eventually CDs. And then, yeah. I realized you could go to college for this. So for making music, which blew my mind, um, it was either that or journalism. And at some point I just felt like this seems more fun to go into the studio and get a diploma for doing it. So there was a recording uh, program near college and um, I just went right into that and never looked back really. What kind of music do you listen to now? What's something on your playlists and like on repeat? It's really all over the place. I'm really in love with great songs. So if, you know, the song could be Iron Maiden or it could be like a pop singer from Norway or, you know, a band from your neck of the woods. It's more about the energy that someone brings to their music, whether it's authentic. Obviously, when women write their own lyrics and um, are unapologetic about their message and what they're doing, I also feel like that's an extra boost of... <laughs> power you know I wish there were more women doing rock and 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 that kind of thing I feel like you know we've got a lot of pop singers who are female but not a lot of rock the song and artist you've chosen is by Tori Amos like can you like talk to me about what you like about Tori Amos what you like about this song why is it your jam this song the glory of the 80s it's not really from any of her early records um 
And it might seem odd to pick Tori, but I feel like certain music stands the test of time for me. Some artists really stand the test of time. So I have gone back and listened to stuff that I listened to when I was like in my 20s or whatever, and it just doesn't stick with me. But for some reason, I feel like she, again, is unapologetic in what she writes about and very funny too, right? A funny in a way, I don't like joke music or like novelty music, but she's always had a bit of humor um, and I'm drawn to that. Um, you know, like some of her lyrics in this song are, are really, really funny, just reflecting on the 80s as a time of excess. And, and I, I know that when she records, it all begins with her. You know, it's like her piano and her voice and then people are brought in around her. And I think when women record or approach recording or performance that way, where they are central to the music, um, you can feel that, right? It's not like she's been brought in, she's singing over a track that someone made, you know, not that that can't be great too, but there's a strong sense of identity with her and I, I just love it. That's Glory of the 80s by Tori Amos, who is this week's Woman of the Week's favourite woman in music. Um, And that's M. Griner as well, who I'm going to be chatting to. Um, And as I said earlier, even, um, M. has such a varied back catalogue of music um, all out that you can go and check out. I really do recommend you do. Um, Ranging from pop to rock, and now she's brought out a jazz album as well. And I was really intrigued by this, so I thought I'd ask her if this journey of producing lots of different genres of music is something that she's really aware of and she really thinks about quite a lot, or if it's just a natural progression of her music. It was never premeditated, um, and I know that there's a bit of a downside to doing all these different things. The downside maybe comes if you're trying to really be understood by people um instead of being driven by like oh this is in my wheelhouse this is my sound this is my genre like i'm am i don't make a irish covers album or whatever i was driven more by curiosity and more by where i was in my life so you know an irish covers album happened because i am part irish and i explored that part of my life um this jazz album happened because my dad is 85. I want to make him a, an album of his favorite songs. Um, everything I've done is sort of mirrored where I'm at in life. And my life has been really <laughs> varied. I love the reaction of fans. Like they get a little worried, but then they come around and <laughs> they just now expect anything. So how do you think like your music has actually changed from being, I saw your first album was like 1997. That was like before I was born. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I'm so sorry to make you feel old. <laughs> but yeah, oh, your, all right. your music from 1997 to 2020, how do you think it's progressed and developed? Um, how do you think you've developed as well as a musician in that time? For sure, you can hear the progression of my voice, particularly from the 90s. Like I started taking vocal lessons around that time, 97. No, a little bit before that. But I kind of dove right in, even though I didn't know what I was doing. Now I vocal coach people and I say the same thing. Like, don't wait until your voice is perfect before you go out and do stuff or you'll never do anything. So I think for a long period of time, even through the time where I was singing back up with Bowie, I don't think my voice was actually at the top of its game. So I've seen it grow over the years. And then in terms of writing, there's a little bit less of like, well, they're not as sad anymore. They're not as depressing. <laughs> uh, but people still like, a lot of my fans love the the early depressing stuff. During the pandemic, I've had these things called happy hangs where I get on Zoom with some of my fan club. And all we do is talk about like depressing songs. Like amongst everything else with all of your music career, you've also, tell me you also have a band. Um, so can you tell me about Trapper and like how that came about? Yeah, Trapper is a band that I um, began with a guy named Sean Kelly, who is a very, very amazing, like Canada's best uh, rock guitarist. Um, he's played so many times in Europe with various bands. Um, I just 
found out about him on social media because <laughs> he was posting about two bands that he was in that I was like, oh, I love both of those bands, but they're so different. It was Nelly Furtado and a band called Helix. And I was like, this guy plays with both of those people. This guy has to be my best friend. So I approached him. We started a band. We found we had so much in common, sort of like musical siblings. We just love uh, all the same things about rock music, you know, the feel good vibe of it, the energy and the power of it. So we created this band called Trapper. We're releasing new stuff, new original music, which kind of came about in the pandemic. Um, also in the band is my brother, Frank, who's a, a awesome videographer and producer and a drummer named Tim Timlek. So it's four of us. I say we're a super group. Maybe it's just because we're over 40. <laughs> um, but we love what we're doing and it's, it's so energizing and it's a, it's a, it's kind of reminded me that of all the things that I've done, everything that I've done, it is what I love the most. Can you talk to me about Winter Long, which is um, the song that you sent me? It's one of about eight or 10 songs that um, we wrote um, at the beginning of lockdown. Lockdown was, um, because it was the first time that a lot of us had experienced it, it just affected each of us in different ways. And for me, I went into a bit of a panic mode in terms of what if I never see this person again, right? What if something happens to my parents or whatever? And I think a lot of us were thinking that. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of worked through a lot of that personal stuff. But then when it came to music, I just thought, like, who do I love make music with the most um and sean had come up with this riff the riff that starts winter long and it was he had all, he had kind of sent it to me before and i wrote something to it before but this time with this mentality of like we could die tomorrow um i mean i laugh but it's not really a laughing matter and we have lost a lot of people but that element of like what are we gonna do if we're not around tomorrow and it's sort of about i guess loving someone through a hard time so in a lot of ways, that kind of mirrors what we've all been going through. Um, and Tim, the drummer, um, Tim Timlek, he uh, really, really brought it to life. He, amazingly enough, had created a whole drum studio in his basement um, a few years prior to this. So um, even though I know it's been hard for him not to get out, he killed this drum part. Like, it honestly feels like the the best drum part I've ever heard in my life. That's Winter Long by Trapper, a band which this week's Woman of the Week, M. Griner, is the lead vocal player in. And uh, throughout lockdown in Canada, M. kept herself entertained and her neighbours entertained by playing small live sessions of her songs on people's driveways in her hometown of St. Mary's, Ontario. And it's a world away from playing Glastonbury with David Bowie in that famous performance in the year 2000. Um, but during lockdown in 2020, M was also getting ready to release her first jazz album, Just For You, which we're going to talk about here. I came up with this as a Father's Day gift for my dad in 2018, just because I bought, I, <laughs> I bought him too many tins of coffee for Father's Day, and I felt I should change it up. So I asked him to pick some songs. He picked them, um, and it eventually led me to Winnipeg where I had discovered some jazz musicians <laughs> earlier in the in that year, actually, in that year. Um, and this guitar player, Larry Roy, who is a professor of jazz, he was so warm and welcoming, and he said, yeah, let's just try this in my studio. I'll do some arrangements. And we brought in a bass player named Julian Bradford, and we just rocked it. And... It was inspired, that arrangement of like guitar, bass, and voice was actually inspired by a woman in my town named Jennifer Thorpe. So think, speaking of women in music, <laughs> give her a shout out because you would think like, oh, you need drums, you need someone on brushes, or you need something extra in there. And for some reason, it just felt so soothing to hear those three instruments. So that's the bulk of the record. And... Um, and then I went to LA to do some originals because I thought 
I'm a songwriter. There should be some originals on here, which is kind of a bold move to put originals alongside those songs. But I think it really worked out. And yeah, that's that's really what I wanted is some calm and escape for, for people. I hadn't like been a jazz kind of fan beforehand. And then when I listened to your album, I was just like, oh, this is, this is nice. Maybe it's because you've got like pop influence in there. Because I'm just a really big pop, pop fan. So maybe that's why. <laughs> Yeah. And you know what? I feel like sometimes when pop artists, people who are traditionally like pop, go into that realm, like the way that Joni Mitchell did, not that she was pop, she was folk, she was a lot of things. But when she forayed into jazz, I mean, that made me go, oh, I'll follow you. You know, I'll follow you into that world. Obviously, we have to talk about playing with David Bowie because they played the David Bowie concert on UK TV um, this year for the first time and I watched it all the way through and it was the first time I'd seen him perform. What was it like working with him and just, and getting to tour the world like that? It must have been just like the most amazing experience ever. It really was. I I joined the band coming out of my record deal, which had gone up in flames. I I got dropped like a lot of artists um, did around that time. There was a big merger that happened. So I felt like kind of open to anything. I didn't, like you, I didn't know really anything about Bowie other than the hits kind of um, and him dancing in the streets with Mick Jagger. That's all I knew. Um, so when they asked me to join the band, I'm not sure I knew how amazing it would be. I just kind of opened myself up to learning his back catalog. At that time, he wanted to play all the hits and then some obscure things from not obscure, but maybe lesser known hits. Um, so it was everything that you would imagine it could be. It was like, you know, be nice hotels, first class planes, like everyone thinking you're awesome. Um, but the deeper part of it was just being around him. He was a really kind of magical guy. Um, he was really curious about music and just fun. And I think I was around him at a time when he was really psyched about life. He was having a baby and he was still like smoking a million cigarettes and just no problems, right? So I was really happy to glimpse that time with him and feel that energy. And um, it definitely was like surreal to play to Glastonbury and to play at Wembley and be around everyone. What's to come from you in the future? Are you maybe coming to the UK? Is anything planned? Can I see you live? <laughs> yes, I would love to come to the UK. And I remember, like I have a 10-year-old, so I remember when I gave birth to him a decade ago, um, I was like, I had toured so much. And I was really like happy to let my passport expire and just be at home and just, you know, make food in a blender, that kind of thing. But now enough time has passed. And I think like thinking about Trapper, um, it would be great to explore the UK and Europe with Trapper. Um, so maybe that's part of the plan. And uh, I think that band is really my focus. I mean, I got the jazz out of my system, so now it's time to put the spandex back on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to go back to jazz now because I'm going to play. Um, <laughs> is that all there is? <laughs> right. It's such an odd song, and for some reason it resonates with me and it's resonated with other people during the pandemic. You know, that is that all there is, that sentiment. Um, so, yeah, I like this one too. Can you introduce it to the airwaves for Gorgeous FM? Hello, I'm Em Griner, and this song is Is That All There Is? If that's all there is the jazzy tones of M. Griner featuring Larry Roy and Julian Bradford is that all there is on Gorgeous FM and her album Just For You is out now and you can follow her on Twitter and Facebook just search M. Griner how to spell that is E-M-M-G-R-Y 
N E R. And she's also on Instagram, M. Griner. Um, uh, just a big thank you as well to M for chatting to me. She gave off such chill vibes during the chat, and it felt like I could chat to her all day, and she was awesome. Um, anyway, on to. 